Thanks, everyone. Um, and when I say thank you to everyone, I you know, actually mean it. I know it's customary to say it, but you could just imagine it if we were here in this, in this um, uh, period of the ramping up of conflict and you sort of you walked into a discussion of reconciliation and the room were empty. <laughs> um, so it is, grat it is gratifying that um, uh, you know, we've come here to try and work out, is it possible? Can something be done? Because I think although you know, looking around at the very serious characters, I see lots of, um, lots of uh, formidable intellectuals here, and everybody's come here with us of an intellectual commitment to this. But I think probably everybody's got something beyond the intellectual commitment as well in trying to see peace in this land that's somehow become intertwixed with the, uh, the fate of this country and all of our countries. And I certainly, I would also be open, be quite open about having that, you know, the non-intellectual the non commitment first. And um, I mean, just, yeah, I perhaps, I don't, don't know about any wisdom, but a few little bits of knowledge, but also um, lots, of sort of, lots of things which have got stuck in my gut over the years over there. And one of them that uh, certainly uh, you know, I, I remember when I think about just the importance of actually finding the, uh, the negotiated solution, the reconciliation, was uh, jumping back to the first few days of September 2001, you know, pre the 11th, where, which was one of the, the lowest ebbs of the conflict in Afghanistan, that phase of the conflict. There have been, of course, there have been, uh, there have been many, many phases. And I remember walking through the, uh, the hills of central Afghanistan um, up at you know, a good few thousand feet, um, where even in the first week of September you get a you get a frost. So if you're out you know, out in the hills, you've got to if you know wash from a bucket in the morning. You have to break the ice and then sprinkle it over. And uh, I was um, looking at the position of um, people who had been displaced by the latest round of conflict, which at that in that in that part in central Afghanistan meant basically Taliban pursuing a scorched earth policy as they settle down for the winter by trying to uh, put a, a nice space between them and the enemy in the field. Um, so they were using you know, matches and bulldozers. Um, f uh, and I was dealing with the, um, the people who had been displaced by that who were sitting in up what, what should be summer pastures, but they had nowhere to go back for the winter. And the task was to work out what on earth you know, can you know, they do and can we do uh, with them uh, to get through another difficult winter. And I came, across, um, uh, I came across a settlement where there was a, a whole a community had gathered. They had a few tents. A lot of people were out in improvised shelters with no, not even canvas over the roof. But they'd all gathered in and around one tent they, there's, I mean, this kind of community has got no particular concept of, of perda. I mean, you know, men and women, uh, children running around on the outside. Uh, and the mullah was sitting, was reciting, and, um, and everybody was you know, in, intently follow, uh, following it. Somehow they detached themselves from the absolute immediate crisis, like, how do we get through the night? Um, and someone, as I, they, as I got there, they, uh, they invited me into the tent, and I sat down, uh, sat down with them. And the mullah came to pause, and someone, uh, and someone asked him, uh, Mullah Sab, what does the Quran say about refugees? And he came out, so I can't remember the, the exact quote, but what he came out with looks, it sounded straight out of, you know, <laughs> out of the Gospel of Matthew, saying, blessed are the refugees, for they will inherit the earth. Mm -hmm. um, and I mean, it was, it was very moving to see these people in, a, uh, you know, in an the most dire of predicaments that you could imagine. And I, you know, I went, of course, you know, family grouping by family grouping, documenting those dire predicaments. They found some solace. They kept hopeful of <coughs> alive. And they did not know that in the, the, you know, this of the, the tragedy that would be uh, visited upon people in this country only a few days later, somehow a new kind of hope for a joint resolution, a joint moving forward might be created. Because when we think about this, so the legitimacy of the the legitimacy of the intervention and the uh, the, you know, the the military forces that the uh, predominantly the West sent there, although of course the, it was the um, uh, it was the Al Qaeda sanctuary and the uh, the involvement of the Taliban in providing that sanctuary, which you know, led the UN to justify a, a Chapter Seven intervention. 
course, these people were victims of the same Al-Qaeda sanctuary because, I mean, there were Al-Qaeda forces who were strengthening the Taliban, enabling them to burn these people's villages. Uh, and you know, in them, the, so the, response, the, the response to the attacks of 9-11 also gave them a, uh, a hope for the future. And of course, now, so many years later, it's still in the balance as to whether it will be sustainable. Well, those, those people are now back in their villages and they have rebuilt their villages and they have a modicum of security. They're now all wondering, you know, can we pull it off? Can we make it last? And that's, so in a sense, the, the non-intellectual reason why we're here and trying to work out, you know, what is the reconciliation strategy which will make such gains as there have been since uh, 2001 in Afghanistan, make them stick. Although that was moving, I mean, you know, we all go through um, uh, rather more cynical experiences in life, and I remember one of the one of the um, one of the cynical experiences I have was listening to my listening to my wife as she came back from a brief a brief venture as a sort of one of these internationally paid consultants. She went off on some ifad mission, uh, wandering around the the Tarparkar Desert in Sindh, where they were to come up with. Um, come up with ideas on what you can do for you know, sustainable development and livelihoods uh, in a um, semi-arid environment. Um, and she was horrified for halfway through the mission when one of the real professionals confided, look, it probably won't work, but we have to give something to Rome, and we have to design this project. Just keep quiet. Um, and you know, she was horrified. She's, my wife is a very principled woman. She did not like to be, to be told that perhaps what she was doing was meaningless. And. Um, I mean, Alex said that they, you know, oh, sorry, uh, Dr. Solomon said that they, um, you know, the military commanders have got a very, you know, they've got a, they've got a strategy, they've got a vision, they're committed to creating some space for the, um, for the political solution, which we know is the only way forward, really. But, you know, this morning before I, uh, before I came over here, and if I had you on tenter hooks, as why is Michael not arriving at, you know, sort of half an hour before the event, of course, you know, I was taking calls from friends back in Afghanistan. Uh, and basically, um, you know, Af Afghan friends who've been through all the multiple phases of conflict were just ringing up to describe the latest stage, stage of the, the military operations. And of course, those who have been following, we've been through the rationale, we know how it you know, relates, relates to surge, relates to creating space, relates to shaping the environment, relates to you know, keeping people um, on, the, on the move before the elections and so on. However, um, what the, uh, you know, what, so the Afghans are not, you know, not perhaps in, in tune with the um, uh, with the rationale, with the, the big write-ups that, um, that the, the commanders have uh, said to explain the, the rationale of their interventions. They're saying, look, on the ground, the Afghans don't believe that the operations can deliver what they're supposed to because none of the Afghans in the areas where the, uh, the forces have now moved into believe in the capacity and intent of the Afghan government and you know, U.S. our forces to, um, to stay there. That they don't believe that they uh, they don't believe that they're going to be there long enough to guarantee that Taliban don't come back and cut off the heads of people who've been involved in cooperating in collaborating with us. They don't believe that the uh, the promises of the uh, community development infrastructure work and so on, which have been uh, hinted at in the early shuras, which have been conducted in the immediate wake of the uh, um, the operations, and um, that they're going to be uh, delivered on. Um, uh, and they're not confident that they um, that they're ever going to see an end to the sort of the you know the abusive side of military operations. However much we put spin on them, nobody likes a military operation conducted in their area. You have a, you know conduct a military operation somewhere in the U.S. Nobody actually likes it there. They want sometimes they want the benefits of it, the security, but they don't actually like to be at the uh, at the rough end. So, I mean, the sort of the, you know the hope is that it doesn't turn out to be something like. Um, like what the IFED, the IFED pros were doing. We, okay, we had to do something, so this is it. And then finally, before I get, well, I'm not going to say get completely intellectual, go slightly intellectual, it was just a um, reflection. Um, I mean, yeah, you know, I, I, got, I got caught out for talking to Taliban. And, you know, and I did, um, you know, men aren't very good at saying sorry. Um, but if, you know, if trying a little bit to promote reconciliation, peace, if it be a sin, Mea culpa, I'm a sinner and I'm a repeat sinner. Um, so, you know, one of, my, one of my latest conversations with a commander who's very much involved on the other side um, in, the, uh, in the insurgency and is, um, is still uh, you know, risking his life and persuading young men to risk their lives to fight against NATO forces. Um, you know, when you sit down and actually open up, I mean, it, you know, 
however much you get inside his soul, um, that particular group of fighters, they're familiar, they have a conception of what they're fighting as a um, as national resistance. They have a conception that they are fighting to f remove foreign forces. They have got very little conception of end state in terms of institutions or how Afghanistan will run as being terribly different from you know what they expect to be done. They haven't, they haven't thought that through. They uh, they didn't have any particular. Um, f uh, you know, political ambition and say, aha, this is a power grab. Um, they have yeah, some, some idea of wanting to go home and live normally after it's, after it's over. And of course, you know, uh, yeah, any of us who've done the kind of, you know, kind of negotiating that you know, Alex mentioned, I've done over the years, um, you know, we're used to tactical play, used to trying to guess what they're at, and we know it's Afghanistan, there are always, you know, there's a dialogue inside a dialogue inside a dialogue. But you know, when you manage to sit someone down by the riverbank, and you're drinking lots of cups of tea, and you've got a long-term relationship. You know, you can get little glimpses inside their soul, inside the soul. <laughs> that, that wasn't tactical. So of course, now I feel to say, look, you know, but you know, you know, you sort of hint back to the story of the uh, the families in the tents, and you know, what was the rationale of a Chapter Seven intervention? And saying, you know, look, you know, nobody wants to occupy your land. <laughs> the, President Obama has made it clear if you need it more clear again in the uh, in the Cairo speech. Um, you know, do you realize that you are persuading young men to go out and give their lives, fighting for something that basically everybody on the other side is already committed to, and, you know, and, and vice versa? Uh, and uh, again, before we get on to the, little, the minor intellectual part of it, I mean, I find it deeply emotionally troubling that we haven't got a, an effective political and reconciliation process when if you go by the, the, you know, the again, the non-tricky accounts of what people are fighting for, there's major convergence in the aspiration of the different sides. That you know, everybody claims to be wanting you know peace and peace and stability in Afghanistan with the security of Afghanistan maintained by Afghan forces who are subject to the rule of law. I mean, everybody on every side says they want it. So, um, where's the political process to deliver it? Okay. Um, I mean, there are a few points in the book. I mean, it's about a dozen points. Um, let me just quickly run through it and yeah, read the book if you've got time <laughs> to get the more of the detail. Um, just after the, my, uh, you know, my experience of the mullah explaining that the refugees will inherit the earth, um, you know, we had the, the bond process, which was supposed to have reconciliation built into it. That the, um, you know, that it's, you know, the sort of the, the architecture actually looks quite good. It's not, I mean, it's, yeah, it's certainly not about occupation. It's about an agreement amongst Afghans after a protracted period of civil war, not just the, sort of the fight of us versus the Taliban, uh, in which you have agreed institutions, you have a process to strengthen those institutions and over time, uh, and you have a, uh, a principle of inclusivity where those who may be excluded at the start actually are able to, uh, to come inside. And there are specific reference, references to reconciliation and acknowledgement that reconciliation is necessary. It all, you know, it all looks good that the, you know, you know, hope, you know, we shouldn't be sitting here today because you know, Bonn might have been able to fix it. Um, of course, the reality was that we know that the, you know, the, the Bonn agreement um, was done in haste. Um, and it was it it had to be done in haste, partly because we weren't ready. We hadn't moved. You know, you know guess what? You know, this would be, we'd been tardy on tardy on the political side of things post uh, September 11th, and you know, lots of resources thrown into the, the military side. And actually, the military did their job much faster than any of the civilians <coughs> ever thought they'd be able to. Um, so you had this whole thing of facts were rapidly being created on the ground because one faction who had, not just that they had, you know, the one faction had been more assisted by the United States, as often, often argued. They were just, they're a bit like, um, uh, they're a little bit, you know, anybody watch their school by football, there's always a certain, you know, you know soccer that they, um, there's always a certain kind of people who don't do an awful lot of running around. They manage to sort of, to hang around quite close to the goal and somebody else puts the ball fairly towards there and they can avoid an offside rule. They just tip it in and they claim the, you know, they claim the goal. Um, anyway, a faction had got themselves into Kabul on that, uh, on that basis. They were creating facts on the ground by putting in an institution, uh, a, a, you know, a, a temporary administration, uh, which looked awfully as if they would like to sit, they would like to sit there um, and essentially reignite another round of civil war because it was not a broad national, uh, nationally representative administration. Bonn had to create a legal basis 
for an international presence in Afghanistan and the basis of a process which could redress the, um, the, you know, the political imbalance that this temporary administration could have been created. It had to be done fast. So it meant that the, uh, although there was a principle of inclusion over time, uh, inclusion was not delivered in the, um, uh, the interim administration that was sort of signed off in Bonn, where basically everybody who got to the talks um, got said, okay, you know, ministry for you, ministry for you, ministry for you, and make sure that they, uh, the key, um, that the, the key security minister, ministries go to the faction which had grabbed Kabul, because otherwise, how could you persuade them to sign off on the deal? It's a sort of a gambit, but I know there's, I mean, there's a, there is an inherent logic to that gambit, but it had to be backed up by subsequent, um, f uh, subsequent political work, making sure that the others really did come on board. And if you look at the, um, if you look at the political process, the, the, uh, the Bonn Agreement was followed by this provision for Lloyd Jurga in uh, six months later, um, the constitution making, subsequently to, through to the elections. Um, there were opportunities for uh, those people without whose participation you could not say there was a balanced and sustainable administration. There were opportunities to bring them on board. Um, you know, we didn't manage. It's not that they, it's not that somehow there was a you know there was this great <coughs> exclusion that somehow uh, you know anti-terrorist clauses or something you know pre uh, prevented us uh, from f uh, bringing the uh, missing parts of the Pashtun um, political universe uh, into the process. There was provision we didn't we didn't manage to do it. You know, got a few ideas on why that didn't happen in the um, f uh, in the book, but other people will no doubt have to investigate it further. Um, there's, I, I propose in the book just one little indicator as to how little progress we made on it, um, which was 12 out of 142. I mean, it's nice to, I know that these days you have to have metrics, particularly if you're here. I, thank goodness I got away without a PowerPoint today. <laughs> but they, um, for, you know, this, is, you know, this is a metric that one can use, which I think um, it's the, uh, there are 142 names on the, uh, the UN uh, 1267 sanctions list, which are basically designating you know, so the, the big people of the Taliban. So in a sense, that's the, you know, the nearest thing you can get to an objective statement of who are recognized as a sort of the, you know, the ruling elite from the, the regime which had just been toppled. Um, 12, you know, uh, 12 of those have been um, brought in uh, to the process subsequently. So 12 out of 142. And if you're talking about, if you're talking about a, um, a stabilization process which um, uh, manages sort of to keep the, keep the, sort of the displaced side on board, if not in power, um, 12 out of 142 is um, treading on pretty thin ice. It's not the, um, there's been little inclusion of the, uh, of the previous regime, which was you know, part of the, the, the Pashtun political universe. Um, anyway, we didn't manage to get them on board. Um, and if you look at what happened, apart from the fact that the, in, the, you know, in the Lloyd Jirga we only had you know, two, or three, uh, two or three of the Pashtuns coming on, subsequently of the, of the Tal Taliban Pashtuns coming on, subsequently in the election process, some participation, not much. Um, other things were going on, in a sense, you know, away underneath the radar, uh, separate from the, the major political processes, uh, which were, of course, the, the process of alienation and insider-outsider dealing. That they, the, this is something which, of course, there's no commitment to it written down in, uh, in Bonn, but the reality was what happened was that as we put in all the money, put in the, uh, put in the forces, uh, put in the support to an Afghan administration, which was, of course, again, the, the, bond, uh, the bond logic, uh, we were doing that uh, on top of a legacy of multiple complex conflicts, which were all overlapping and which we, of course, not all of which we understood, some of which many of us have you know, struggled hard to understand. Uh, and, of course, conflict actors position themselves relative to the, uh, the new political setup. And uh, many of the, the people who had been part of, the, the, part of, this, of the, the ruling elite at the time that the Taliban came to power, who were, you know, the Taliban had taken on and displaced, that they, the new administration brought them back into positions of power. They used those positions of power um, to prosecute their old conflicts. But this time, they were able to use a terminology which we provided to them, particularly they used the, the great terrorist terminology, one of the wonderful little sort of linguistic coincidences rather than, um, uh, rather than sort of something that um, you, know, you, could sort of, uh, you could explain using Chomsky, um, uh, is that terror, the um, uh, Persian word to, uh, to kill, 
murder, it's rather close to terror. And so uh, when uh, the word terrorist has got a certain resonance, people in a sense, Afghans already understand it, reflecting to terror, terror, terror. Um, uh, so basically, that the uh, parts of the new establishment had an opportunity to label their rivals as terrorists. Uh, and cut a long story short, in the period of uh, two, you know, uh, late 2001, 2002, uh, many, of, uh, many of those who had survived from the old regime, the Taliban regime, who had expected to be able to stay on in Afghanistan uh, and um, join the new setup. Basically, they expected to be able to go, you know, go home. Tal you know, Taliban regime, it's over. There's a new Afghanistan. We'll be part of it as well. We always, you know, we've, we've always done that. We always know how to switch, know how to switch sides. We're highly pragmatic. Um, you know, they go home. Instead, they get and end up being labeled as terrorists. Um, some of us are looking for terrorists. Thank goodness we found some because this helpful, this helpful man here has brought some terrorists to us. Um, yeah, we raid their houses. Anyway, we drive many of them to Pakistan. We sow the seeds of a future insurgency. They, because when you look at the, when you, when you document, the, uh, document how the uh, insurgency originated, many of the specific fronts, I mean, places that they, yeah, areas where specific groups of fighters came together, they were initiated uh, around so the little pearl that had been formed of uh, alienated former fighters who had tried to uh, accommodate themselves to the new setup but were rejected and were driven out. And it's something to remember that sometimes when, uh, when people talk somewhat laxly about how, they, uh, how we got here in the conflict in Afghanistan, uh, we sort of think of, the, uh, we think of the fight today as a direct continuity of the fight of October and November 2001. That's not the case. If you actually, although, okay, maybe there's been, you know, maybe there's been no month when there's been complete peace inside Afghanistan. There have been, you know, you have to go back and periodize the conflict. You had, okay, so there's a tough fight during October, you know, October and November, and you, know, you can date it up to uh, December. You can perhaps take it through to February 2002 um, with the, uh, the battle in Shahikot under you know, Operation Anaconda. But then, for the rest of 2002, uh, essentially, the, you know, the, the confrontation with Al Qaeda Taliban is, to all intents and purposes, is over. It's finished. I mean, of course, there's a bit of mopping up going on, but there is no, uh, there's no major organised resistance coming from their side. And actually, the conflict during 2002 was a different conflict entirely. There are 12, 12 major uh, armed clashes, which I mean, I've documented during uh, during that period. All of them were, I forget what the, how the colors are. I think, is it green on green, blue on blue? What do you call it? I mean, it's green, our friends, yeah. Yeah. It's our friends versus our friends. Um, yeah, in just about all of those dozen conflicts in 2002, Marshal Fahim, then the defense minister and soon to become vice president, <laughs> um, perhaps, um, that they, uh, yeah, he was arming both sides. <laughs> um, uh, yeah, there was a, yeah, it was not surprising that we should be through that. There were policy measured responses to that. I mean, I certainly was, as a UN officer, I would be woken up early in the morning by, um, f uh, you know, the sort of com ice after going, you know, jump on a plane with, the, uh, with Asif Dilawar and various people, you know, to go and do um, uh, little bits of firefighting. And then there was strategic work, which was done as a shift over to SSR, DD uh, DDR, that the um, f uh, finance minister, Ashraf Ghani, being extremely decisive in his intervention in trying to cut off the, uh, the financing of the, um, the people who were running these militias. And actually, I think there was a, if I'm, if I'm not wrong, uh, Wazir Saab, I mean, there was this showdown between uh, yeah, Marshal Fahim and Ashraf Ghani, where basically came to, it's, it's either him or it's me. Um, because uh, Marshal Saab was committed to, he was doing political patronage, building up a constituency, trying to maintain, make sure that he was a force uh, in, uh, you know, in the new Afghanistan at the cost of sustaining conflict. Uh, and uh, Finance Minister Ashraf Ghani was uh, committed um, to reining in the financing of that and using a strategic approach um, to uh, removing the basis for continuing conflict. And so in a sense, you know, we have the, actually yeah, there are good bits of the story that sometimes people, um, f uh, people forget. We went through a different conflict during 2002, and actually it was solved, and that's gone, over. Anyway, um, but, but subsequently in 2003, you get you know, a new conflict going again, which is the, you know, the re-emergence of the, the new Taliban, new movement, a confrontation against, the, um, against the, um, the, the new Afghan government, the Western support of that. Uh, and in their recruiting strategy, they, of course, they fed upon the mistake, our mistakes. 
that the, uh, our failure to see through the anticipated inclusiveness uh, in the, uh, the post-bond setup uh, and our failure to rein in the alienating practices uh, of, this, of the people in this, of the middle level of the, the new establishment. Anyway, um, they, although that's sort of, you know, those are the, the, the frustrating parts when you start to look at the, um, the emergence of the, the new conflict, um, uh, there are bits of, bits of hope when you look at what happened post-2001. Ten minutes, I can manage about ten minutes, that's right. Um, they, uh, some things went right which give you ideas of, you know, where, we, where to go to uh, now that I gave you the, you know, the figure of 12 people from the old elite who came, you know, who were brought on board. When you start to look at significant figures who, uh, who've been involved with the, the, the Taliban and the insurgency and um, who have uh, you know, rejected continuing violence and have been incorporated into the, the new setup, um, one of, the, one of the, the little findings I got as I was, you know, I was doing this was that the big people haven't really come in through organized, institutionalized programs, the kind of thing for which you, you, know, you write a I know, uh, sort of project concept note and budget it and structure it. They've come in through much more informal and Afghan pr uh, processes, uh, with polit political patronage being the most obvious one. That they've come in, that they, the, the big people have come on board when there's been an influential insider, well placed in the regime, who has the capacity to get things done inside the new setup. When there's a problem, they can pick up the phone and they can talk to somebody in the interior ministry and say, look, there's somebody, you know, this, this has happened to somebody, you know, somebody's brother has been picked up and they really ought, they, you know, they really ought to be inside and so on. And that they, these, where these insiders have had some kind of network link, as a bond of comradeship, tribal link with the, you know, the, the excluded uh, members from the Taliban, those are the links that the uh, they otherwise combatants have invoked to be, because they're guaranteed a, f a hearing that they know that that person can't ditch them, can't throw them out. Um, so a little hint that they, drawing on, drawing on the, the social fabric of Afghan society gives you the most chance of making concrete progress and reconciliation. Um, they, they, um, but when you, do, when, when you do start to look at you know, laying the groundwork for what's to be done now, one of the things I, we had a, sort of a joke earlier on in the year about so the idea of you know, we need to open an institute of Taliban studies. I mean, anything, anything which is going to uh, use a political approach to address the current conflict has got to be based on an understanding of the actors of what's happening in the conflict. So there's a lot. And I mean, it's remarkable, actually, how thin the knowledge is. Um, one of the insights which I've, uh, which I've suggested, which should be driving approaches to reconciliation, is drop any idea of somehow this you know, grand Leninist organization that is the Taliban. I mean, it's almost like it's a, it's a coincidence of history that most of the insurgents are actually labeled as Taliban at the moment. Because like, the, the anthropologists might say, they're not real Taliban, but it just, it just happened, that label was applied because you know, who happened to, you know, to control Kabul and Kandahar just before this thing got going. The, um, there's a segmented insurgency that they, there are multiple networks which have got their own bonds of comradeship, reasons that people have clustered around a, a charismatic or powerful uh, commander, uh, and you know, they've all linked up like this, and then somebody applied the label Taliban to them. So this is the kind of insight that you're going to have to do. If you're going to come up ultimately with a political, a political approach um, to addressing this, you've got to build this kind of insight into your strategy, what you're going to do. Um, they, uh, when I... Uh, some, some, of the, one of, some of the interesting stuff I did in this was just looking at like, sort of, you know, typologies of approaches which have been tried. Um, and you know, because quite obviously a lot of things have been tried since um, 2001. Um, one of the things which I've looked at is the terms of the bargain which is being, uh, which is being offered. And I think that I saw, so I saw it in Patty's notes as well, so she's going to elaborate on it. <laughs> um, uh, that they, the assumption when people, when people in, you know, inside the current regime, Karzai's regi regime, and you know, from our side, when they started trying to come up with formal approaches to reconciliation. So the idea was that, look, um, you know, history is with us, uh, that they, you know, we have basically, basically we've stabilized Afghanistan. There's just a bit more mopping up that has to be done. And uh, what we're doing is that the idea of reconciliation is just to, you know, to, to complete that mopping up. So um, you know, we, opted, we offered something which is called you know, basically, basically co-option. Um, you know, 
they've done wrong, but fortunately they've come in and they said, I'm sorry, we've laid down our arms, we you know, swear, um, swear allegiance to the new setup, and um, they will be allowed to, you know, to go home and they won't get, uh, they won't get locked up. And that's, so that's the uh, formal programs have basic, has been based upon that. Um, what I've been suggesting is it's simply, it's, uh, you know, no major, no major reconciliations have been affected by this, and the current ground reality in terms of um, the relationship between the, uh, the Karzai government, and our, you know, our allies, um, and the non-state actors which are challenging them have changed in such a way that there's very limited mileage to be had from this kind of co-option. Uh, one of the things has got to be, you've got to move towards an accommodation. Now, accommodation doesn't just mean getting weak. In the, context of, uh, in the context of where I say were the roots of the insurgency, that many of the people who have been driven into the, driven into the insurgency actually have a set of grievances, which in a sense, it's not that it's out of weakness we'd want to address those. Out of pursuit of social justice, we, it's part of our core mission to adjust those. So there's a, very, there's a very legitimate case to be made for inducing an accommodation process where the, the terms of a bargain are not just come in, lay down your arms, say sorry, but actually work out what, you know, what went wrong to drive those people into the conflict in the first place. And, you know, and if it really is, for example, you know, a wayward district governor who is uh, deliberately trying to drive the other tribe out, you know, address that. Um, with mind to, your, um, uh, mind to your 10 minutes, I put, uh, five, good, good, yeah, I'm getting there. Um, <laughs> Uh, uh, I mean, a quick little note, Pakistan can help. That's what I said in my, you know, the, the speaking point. The point that they, so far, one of the main things that, you know, all the, all the things that international community or the U.S. have been asking Pakistan to, um, to do in this post have basically been nasty. I mean, you know, it's been, obviously been asking for concrete security cooperation. Facilitate, you know, facilitate access for various kinds of military forces, arrest, you know, arrest people, don't make too much trouble when we kill people. I mean, broadly, that's the, uh, the cooperation which has been looked at for Pakistan. Um, as it happens, that the, uh, there's been an interesting, um, there has, yeah, even before there was much talk of reconciliation on the, sort of the international side, um, very, some of the Pakistani actors had been saying, well, you know, what, can, what more can be done to push ahead with the, you know, the inclusiveness you said you were going to do? Get those people who are currently involved in the insurgency actually politically incorporated in the new setup inside Afghanistan. Um, concretely, there is cooperation which Pakistan can be requested to supply on that, which may be more palatable um, than the, uh, the thing which they've always been, you know, they've been very effective at dodging, which is in a sense that they, um, the, the major arrests. Um, because you know, we know the, the history that they, um, there have been a lot of arrests of al-Qaeda inside, uh, inside Pakistan, that the track record on moves <laughs> against the Taliban have been uh, much more limited. Um, on, uh, you know, it's not the time to go into all the details of you know, the mechanics of what can be done on, recon uh, on reconciliation from our side, but at least one can say that there must be continuing robust international support, which means in terms of you know, whatever's, done on, whatever's going to be done on reconciliation, you know, International actors are going to have to fund it. We need to put we need to put res resources behind it. When you think of the um, the the vast vast resources which are committed to the military side, an appropriate allocation towards reconciliation, as long as we're doing the right thing, uh, makes sense. Um, but also, um, there uh, uh, I argue, and it's a slight hint of controversy in it that there is um, there is a scope for the international side to be involved in dialogue actually doing some of the reconciliation dialogue because that they hitherto the doctrine in reconciliation has been that the um, Afghan government must directly lead all reconciliation efforts and all the international community do was help when asked that the uh, one of the things that I propose is that the uh, the reality is as we as the con conflict transformed through 2001 2002 2003 you know, we Became you know, confirmed in our status as a belligerent. We're not just the, the we're not just the neutral uh, neutral observers. The, but even small reconciliation only makes sense if it is seen as one component in the overall strategy. And unless you've got the investment in institutions, unless you've got other work towards you know, delivering justice, uh, the uh, the small reconciliation achieves nothing. And I mean, I find as somebody who has worked on justice in small ways over the, <coughs> over the years, I find it deeply, deeply upsetting that the notion that one of the, <coughs> one of the issues around which in the insurgents are able to mobilize is actually absence of justice. 
And when you think of how vilified the Taliban are here, in, you know, in, the, in this part of the world, this notion that they are actually able, in some places, to be able to recruit people or try and uh, justify themselves, that they are the ones who deliver justice, where our ally, whereas our allies don't, it's deeply upsetting. When you think of this is the, moral, the, the moral certainty with which we approached this back in 2001, you know, we, that's, a, you know, that's a dilemma that we shouldn't have today, but we do. So just at the end, I'd say that <coughs> Where, the, I mean, where this book takes, I mean, where this book takes us to is that at this point that at least small reconciliation can be done, which is that at least through approaches, I mean, uh, yeah, going about it systematically, strategically, sensibly, with the grain of Afghan society, many of the component networks who are currently mobilized inside the insurgency can actually be brought, broadly brought inside the current setup. That that will not end conflict in Af Afghanistan, but it may have a strategically significant impact on the conflict, basically reduce the number of people who are prepared to be on the battlefield. That, although this is not intended as a counterinsurgency argument, I can see, you know, obviously the counterinsurgency is, how that, you know, that's, that's great. That makes it easy for us to go after the rest, uh, the rest of them. I mean, that's probably the current realistic pragmatic position. But I think that there is, um, uh, there is an onus on all of those, you know, all of us who are yeah, inspired with this desire that surely, you know, surely peace is attainable if, they, uh, if there is significant overlap between the aspirations of those on all sides. You know, we shouldn't take this as good enough. We also have to look forward. I mean, we have to see, is it possible to do more than what I've said is doable in this book? And what can be done to create the conditions in which something a bit more like a, a, grand, a bond, grand bargain can be achieved? Uh, in which actually you do get to a, a political engagement which aspires to put an end to the major, the national conflict in Afghanistan. Of course, there will be multiple local conflicts that will be dealt with over time. What has to be done to lay the ground that that can happen? Because, I mean, you know, even if it's just another place in a you know, forgotten part of the world, God forsaken, 30 years of conflict on top of multiple conflict, even then it's not good enough to say, oh, well, th that's what they were born to. But particularly given the way in which this country, my country, all of our countries have intervened there over so many years. You know, we are also morally bound um, to, to strive that bit further uh, to, uh, pers to, to come up with a reconciliation strategy which goes beyond the little things in this, which delivers something bigger, which delivers a political settlement in which that they, we can get back to you know, what it seemed for a while after you know, the, the last months of uh, of 2001 that we, you know, we would be uh, doing, which would be part of this you know, rebirth of Afghan society, a, a peaceful country building its institutions and escaping from 30 years of conflict.